right. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, Story Comic Presents, episode 19, and we have with us uh, the acclaimed uh, fantasy, fantasy and horror author, Richard Lee Byers. So, Richard, thank you for joining us on this uh, Thursday evening. Oh, my pleasure. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, as I say, so, so Richard Lee Byers, he has, you have now, by the last count, you have over 40 fantasy and uh, fantasy and horror novels to your name i think it might be over 50 by now is it 50 now okay i think, right. I think it might be yeah <laughs> and well and also too and part of it too is that you do have a pretty wide library of that through the forgotten realms universe and i also checked you also have like over 80 works of short fiction to your name as well like sounds about right well over 80 so it's you have a virtual if you you have a literal library of books that that you've authored so far yeah i would all have been too dumb to quit <laughs> and i'm sure there's people out there who probably just have like an entire shelf dedicated to uh, richard lee byers books so so as i say thank you for joining us and uh we'll we'll get right we'll get right into it and so as we say a lot of people um uh, who are watching or listening to this, uh, you know, part of it is want to get to know the, the person behind the pen. So do you want to first kind of, you know, as you say, uh, give people a bit of your background and how you got into writing? Yeah, well, I, um, from an early age, I discovered kind of, you know, fantastic fiction, Edgar Rice Burroughs and H.G. Wells. And, um, and I was uh, an imaginative, imaginative kid and a pretty, uh, you know, articulate kind of kid, good with words, good in English class. And it dawned on me early on that, uh, yeah, I could probably write this kind of stuff and enjoy writing it and maybe make a living at it. But I didn't get going real fast because um, I uh, was told by a number of people that, you know, you really you know, aren't going to make a living doing this. So you should have a, you know, kind of a real job. And then you do this in your spare time, which is kind of simultaneously good and bad advice. I mean, it's good because it's true. It is hard to make a living at it. It's bad though, because it can really, um, it can really stop you from ever getting going or, or doing very much. What happened to me was I, the choice I made for my real job was, um, I was going to be in the mental health field. So I got a master's in psychology and I went to work in a uh, emergency inpatient psychiatric service. And it was um, so um, draining that when I came home at night, I didn't want to write anything. I just wanted to goof off. So I, did, I didn't write anything for a number of years. And then um, sadly, my mom passed away, but she left me some money. And I looked at, um, looked at that amount of money and it was like, well, I can't live well on this but I can survive on this for a while if I want to give writing a chance and I'm, I'm really tired of the mental health field. And it really seems like if I'm going to try writing, it's now or never. So uh, I, I left that job and I started writing and uh, eventually and things went from there. Yeah. So, and I know some previous, uh, previous interviews asked you, did your your master's degree in in, uh, in was it clinical psychology? It's boy, it it was just psychology is what psychology. It on okay. the diploma, but it it was the the concentration was on clinical stuff. Okay, and so I know the previous previous um, interviewers asked you did did that degree help you in your writing? So I'm going to ask you the opposite question: Did your writing before that help you in your when you're working in the mental health field? I don't think so. I never, uh, I never made any kind of connection. I hadn't really done much writing since, um, you know, for several years prior to, um, to uh, going to actually going to work in mental. So that might account for the disconnect, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't really think that I saw any particular relationship or anything. Okay. Writing was way, way on the back burner for most of that time, actually. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, the, the level of the level that you would take through that, the level of empathy you would take to, as someone that you said you're writing as a writing when, when you were younger. So that was my, that was just my curiosity piece to it. Now, what was, so you, you're able to sit down and how long did it take you to make that decision to start writing and then getting your, your first book published? Let me think. Um, I think it was I think I sold a um, 
short story or two, a co- well, a couple short stories to uh, kind of small press markets in the first year. And I think I sold the my first novel in the second year of trying. Okay. So that, okay. All right. I see. Was it Goddess, Goddess by Night? That was the one that you first... Uh, no, that was, well, that was, God, was that my very, very first publisher, my very first thing I sold? I think it was, um, might have been, might have been. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like, you know, it's way back in the mists of time. And that was one of, one of the first anyway. Yeah. So yeah, you had like the chain and goddess of night where, where it's oh, the chain. Like, that was the first one. Okay. Okay. And you did, so it looked like that you were doing, uh, it was about four or five years that you were doing short fiction selling before your the first novel that you were able to get published. Well, the first the first couple the first couple novels that I did, um, it wasn't that long, but they were novels that um, came out from a small publisher that tanked immediately after publishing them. I I, I don't think I killed them, but maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so you really, nobody ever saw those books. The first book that anybody ever saw really was a book that I, first book I did for Zebra called uh, The Vampire's Apprentice. Mm. Like, so there were two before that, but they just, you know, vanished in the mist. Without <laughs> anybody, pretty much anybody ever reading them. So how did you, so I guess the question for people that'll be listening or, or, or watching this interview, the, you know, is, uh, be asking the questions like, I want you know, I, I'm a writer. I like writing, I like writing, uh, you know, fantasy or horror. How do I get noticed? How did, how did, how do I, what do I do now if I want to, you know, have a publisher, whether it be small or large to, to take notice of you? What was your steps that you did to, to first get, uh, your work started to get published? Well, what I did, I always want to say this with a disclaimer because it was way back in like the uh, late eighties, early nineties and, you know, publishing like everything else has changed since then. So I may be giving, so I might be saying things about how I broke in. That's no longer the way anybody with any brains breaks in. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, but, um, it was it's, as far as selling short fiction. It was a pretty straightforward process. You um, and I, I think that part of it has not really changed that much. You just uh, identify the markets and and write something, and uh, you know pay attention to the guidelines and the formatting they want, and just start mailing them in. Now with novels, um, you could you could pretty much back then get people to look at a novel at any publisher if you, if you did it right and the way that you did it right at that point was to um to identify a particular editor at that house that um that uh handled your kind of stuff and then you'd query that editor and then um if the editor wrote back and said uh yeah i'll look at it then you could send it in and it was no longer what was called an unsolicited submission which was what a lot of book publishers said they wouldn't look at and are, are I think, or maybe you're not looking at now, but, um, you know, so you, you didn't really need an agent. I have the impression that, um, at least maybe at some publishers, it's harder to get in the door and get noticed these days if they don't know who the hell you are and you don't have an agent. So, um, you know, for people that want to have a book and want to try to get an agent first, uh, and they, um, they kind of do what I did with publishers. You know, you send off query letters and, uh, and, and hope that somebody will write back and say, yes, I'm an agent. I'd like to see your, your outline and sample chapters or your complete manuscript or whatever it is and go from there. Of course, the heartbreaking thing is that it can be as, it can be really hard to get an agent, just like it's really, it could be, it was really hard to get a publisher. And uh, of course, once you got one, you still don't. You still don't have a publisher. You just have somebody that's going to go to a publisher for you. I mean, it can take it can take years to get an agent, and then where are you? But um, uh, you know, there are there are things that improve your odds. Like if you go to um, conventions and conferences and meet agents and editors face to face, you know, though that can certainly help you. You know, unless you're loathsome and obnoxious when you go or something. Um, they, um, 
that, that can work. Some conventions I've noticed even have uh, pitch sessions where you can meet with an editor and give them the elevator pitch for your stuff and see if they're interested. So um, there are definitely ways to do it. it it's, um, of course, going to conventions can get kind of pricey. And well, of course, we can't do it right now anyway because of COVID-19. But um, but uh, if you want to actually break in and, and become a professional fiction writer, it could be worth the cost. You can at least look around and see what's in your area and what's not too bad, you know. Right. And now, did you, what made you, did you know right from the beginning that you were going to write fantasy and horror? Or was that something that you kind of, that was your passion or is that, was that a, was that a, um, a, a specific decision you made when you decided that you're going to start writing? Well, yeah, that was the kind of thing that I, I'd always wanted to read um, or I, I'd always liked to read. So it was kind of a natural for me to think, yeah, I'm going to write that. I, I kind of thought initially, well, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And then I thought, well, you know, you don't really know enough science <laughs> to write the kind of science fiction that you respect and like to read yourself. So maybe not that one so much, maybe more um, fantasy and horror. And then I looked at the market at the time that I was starting and horror seemed like it was really booming. So I thought, well, okay, well, let's start with horror. And then just about the time I got started, it had the great horror market collapse of the end of the 80s. You know, it was the, the kind of great timing, which has characterized my whole career to one degree or another. And, uh, but, but that was still, that was where I started. And I, I, did, a, I did some horror stuff before I uh, moved into very much heroic fantasy or anything at all. Yeah. And, and I noticed too, is that there is, uh, if you know, doing, doing a search on the different types of fantasy out there, there is literally like hundreds of different genres of fantasy. And, and, and the, the point that you've, uh, that you, that you've, you've mentioned in a, in a previous interview is that you consider that the type of work that you do, um, almost dark, almost there's a dark and pseudo realism about it where you, where you get into the, um, you you, you kind of get into the the characters and you and uh, from that perspective is and did you feel as though as like your the voice that you put into it how did that react to some of the established IPs that you, that you've written for like Forgotten Realms and um, as we said in some other um, some other established um, worlds that you've you've contracted to write in. Well, I think that if you can, um, I think that if you can bring some realistic detail to pretty much any fan work of fantastic fiction that you're writing, it tends to um, make the uh, fantastic parts easier to swallow, you know, and, and so I try to, um, you know, I, I try to, when it's not being just Oh wow. Booga booga magic, you know, uh, to, to make it seem, uh, make it seem like something that could really happen. I mean, it's sort of like, um, I mean, it's like not to compare myself to George R. R. Martin, but when you, um, when you read his series or when you watch, uh, the HBO version, I mean, the, you know, when it's magic it, you know, or monsters, it's, um, you know, it, then it's unabashedly that, but, uh, there's a lot of stuff which just kind of feels like, uh, gritty historical fiction you know uh, but, um you know i, I kind of in my own way i kind of try to do a little bit of that and and how much of it that you utilize like your own i would say like your own experiences as uh, as as you mentioned before too is that you uh you you're you're you you do fencing as well correct yeah I, yeah i've done it for a while but i've done a lot of it yeah, <laughs> but how much of that where do you utilize actually the, the the narration of that when there's actually like fighting happening in your books? How much of that do you do? How much of that is apparent to how much of that is apparent where you um, really get into like the details of that with some of your own personal experience with your your hobbies, for instance? Well, I would say, I mean, I would certainly think on a on one level quite a bit that, I mean, it really develops your sense of, um, of, of kind of what's possible in a fight. You know, it's like, you know, you, you don't, I don't think in my stuff, you'll suddenly find that if you read closely, like the 
relative positioning of the characters has changed in a way that's not accounted for or whatever. Um, um, so at the same time, you do, I mean, you know, what I did was modern sport fencing. Real medieval combat is, is, is definitely very, very different. And uh, for one, I mean, just aside from the fact that um, the fact that you could actually get killed is really going to change your perspective. I mean, the fact that um, the kind of weapons that my characters fight with are, are much heavier than um, modern fencing weapons. And in modern fencing, you do all kind of flashy moves that we really you wouldn't do in a, using heavier weapons. They wouldn't really be possible. Right. And um, so that, so, you know, I, I draw on it, but I, I, I am aware of the differences too and try to kind of respect the differences and not make somebody do have, do something that would work in modern fencing, but it's like preposterous in a medieval combat. Um, the other thing you have to be aware of is, is, and it took me a long time to learn this is that sometimes people aren't as interested in it, all that part of the story as I am. So um, I used to write very, um, I used to write some very involved fight scenes where it's like every damn move is in there, every thrust and cut, and parry and repose to step forward and step back. And um, now I'm more inclined to, you know, kind of be detailed at the start of the fight, uh, you know, the first exchange and then kind of more impressionistic in the middle and then the uh, finishing stroke, it gets detailed again. So I don't make the people that aren't interested in that read every little move where nobody scores <laughs> and how did you was that was that feedback like a, re, a reader gave you or is that something a feedback an editor gave you or how did that Both. Oh, did it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and also too is is the the other the other the other point too that you mentioned uh you mentioned before is that um with uh with the forgotten realm series that you've that you've uh, written numerous books for you also correct me if I'm wrong, but you've also uh, played. You've done. You've you've been a, a a dungeon master for for games as well. Yeah, I've been. I first got into D and D when it was three beige pamphlets in a white cardboard box, and it cost you ten bucks down at the hobby store, and it um, and it came with these horrible, horrible soft little dice. I mean, they, they seem great, you know, it's like, cause who had ever seen anything other than a six sided die, right? Here's an eight sided die. Wow. You know, <laughs> but now you, you look at them compared to modern dice. These are really bad dice. But, <laughs> but yeah, I was in, I was played D and D for the, at the, from the very start and started DMing in due course. And I've done a lot of uh, other uh, role playing games too. Currently I run a, uh, superhero role-playing game for my friends okay uh, what system do you use is it you use champions which i guess champions? is just about an extinct system that a lot of people don't like but it was one that i um one that i knew thoroughly from having played it years ago and uh, when i thought well yeah, i could run this superhero game for my friends i got an idea it was kind of natural for me to go back to the system that um that I already knew, especially when I found out that you could get a lot of the, um, the villain books and stuff like that really cheap online. And I right. thought it's because I, because I don't really have the time or the inclination to build like these campaigns completely from nothing. You know, it's like, I need a, I need character like, like some of the villain books or something like that for, particularly for a superhero game where it's like every character pretty much is individual. Every notable antagonist is, just like in the comics, you know, right. it's like there's the has got to be unique, and it's like you know, who have, after writing all day, I don't have the patience to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you have you ever, you know, while you're while you're running games, have you ever been deliberate to actually utilize that as like as as what other authors would use as like say research? Would you yeah. actually use that to say I I really want to try to figure out this or figure out that? You've never. I've never done that. I've, no. I've had, had people. I've had people talk about that, and and uh, you know, say, yeah, I, my gaming group is this resource, but man, nah, it's always been two separate things for me. Oh, okay, all right. Have you ever have you, had had your friends or ever bugged you to say, hey, can you put this in your next book or anything like that? Um, not really, not no. seriously. No, <laughs> I mean that's um, 
I mean, it would have to, my campaigns tend to have like very kind of elaborate storylines. So, um, you know, it'd have to be like, yeah, I commit to writing a 10 book series based on the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> to tell this epic that I'm telling in the game, and it's like, and no, and there's also the issue that because I'm using, uh, you know, it's about half canned material and half me, right? Then how am I going to weed all that canned material out so I'm not stepping on somebody's copyright? It would be very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> and did you? Oh, that's interesting. So, so you're not so. Right now, so my so my next that kind of feeds into my next question is, what would you consider kind of like the the, the benefits and uh, the benefits and drawbacks of of writing in an established IP? Well, the um, one of the benefits is that there's a um, there's kind of a floor on sales that um, you know you're probably you know, you, some people are going to buy it and read it. Uh, the drawback is that with a lot of IPs, there might be kind of a ceiling too. You're not going to break out and have a best, it's hard to break out and have like a big, big seller. Of course, a lot of that depends on the IP. There are books that, um, there are books that, um, that do that. And uh, it's like in Forgotten Realms, you know, Bob Salvatore's books were all hit, all hit the Times bestseller list. He was the, he was the guy that uh, really showed it could be done. And there are books based on um, some c computer games like Doom that have been big sellers too. So, you know, it, it depends on the audience for the IP to, a, I guess, to a degree, what, how big you can expect it to be. It's, um, it can be, a, it can be a lot of fun if you um, like the, um, like the world that you're writing about. If you didn't like the world that you were writing about, I think it would be a real hassle. Mm -hmm. uh, it would, you'd be kind of, you'd be kind of second guessing yourself, kind of saying, "Well, that's stupid," you know. <laughs> not your, not what you created necessarily, but what you, what the situation in the world that you were reacting to. Right. And, um, but uh, I mean, I've, I've I've done more of it than you know, not than my own stuff. Although I have done my own stuff and. Um, it's um you know i find it enjoyable i probably you know, it probably depends partly on your strengths i mean i think that um i think that i have a more natural affinity for um character and plot than i do for um world building although i can do world building and i hope that i do it well and i do do it but um if somebody else has already built the world you know that, that can be okay with me <laughs> And, and what aspects would you say, what aspects of it was your, as you're writing that, that you find just flow so much easier for you? Is it the character interaction, the, and, uh, the in, internal dialogue? Is it the, the use of the action of, of magic or, 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 or the, the, the politics of it? What do you see when you're sitting down there typing away? What are, what are the parts of it that just come right out right, super easy for you? Um, well, I think that I do dialogue relatively easily, and um, I think I do fight scenes relatively easily, although I've, with fight scenes, I've done so many of them that sometimes I uh, do find myself, thinking, did I do that before? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> another book, because if I did, I want to do something a little different, but um, probably those two things. Uh, uh, the, the, the politics, I mean, that's just, um, I mean, that's just a particular kind of plot you know and uh I'm, I'm, I'm plotting comes fairly easily to me i mean I, not necessarily not necessarily um every detail before i ever sit down to write anything but uh, i can pretty much get the broad strokes and um before i start writing and i'm not go horribly horribly off track you know you hear you hear people say you know well the story just took over and it was like i was in this completely different place it's like now that doesn't happen. I mean, I'll think of cool ways to do things and and, and uh, interesting bits of business I can throw in as I go along. But I usually, well, pretty much without exception, the story turns out to be 
about the characters doing pretty much what I thought they would do to accomplish the goal that I pretty much assumed that they had. Right. And, and so how does that, how does that work normally? Is it, is there a standard thing where you have the, the publisher would call and say, uh, say, you know, Richard, we, uh, how, how much of a, how much of a, a point do they say, we just want you to tell a story in this land, or do they say, we need to make sure you do whatever you want, but make sure this happens in the end. Or how does that, what, what, what's the, um, uh, I guess, what's the restrictions that, that you, they, that publishers normally put on you when you write for an IP, an existing IP? It really varies. Yeah. Um, it's, um, like in Forgotten Realms, it's, it's kind of, um, depending on what book I was working on at the time, they would, the degree of, uh, of kind of, supervision and coordination would vary a lot like when i did my book for the uh the th- the four th- thief th- uh themed books that they did you know it was basically just kind of we'll write a book about a rogue and um then when i did the the my book for what was one of the f- four books about priests it was the same thing just write a pick a cleric and you um you pretty much had carte blanche as long as you weren't stepping on something that somebody else was doing you know it's like if if you if if i'd come back and said well i want to do my priest book set in the kingdom of such and such and it was like well no some other writers already writing a big epic story about that uh land and we don't want to complicate things by having you having your story happening there too so figure out where else to set it or something like that or, um, you know, if you came back with a story about a dragon and it was like, well, you know, we already have three dragon stories that are coming up by the writers. So, uh, don't do a dragon story, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, with those kind of, within those kind of limitations, you, you were pretty free. Now something like, um, you know, I'd also did books where, um, they wanted me to accomplish a particular thing to, uh, to create a particular change in the world. Like I did a trilogy called The Haunted Lands, and The Haunted Lands was supposed to uh, take their uh, land of Thay as it currently existed in the Forgotten Realms and um, make it into a very different place by the end. And uh, a, a particular kind of very different place. So it was like, okay, I know that this, this, this has to happen. And when I did War of the Spider Queen, you know, that was a six book series each one by a different writer and i did book one and uh i was probably the least constrained of anybody because i was doing book one so that you know i i had the least amount of crap that other people had done to um to 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 worry about and telling my story but i mean with that book there was um there are a lot of meetings and a lot of the back and forth about you know where, what's the overall story we're telling and what do you have to accomplish in book one so that book two can be as it should be and et cetera. And that, that was, I think that was the, that was the book that of any book I've ever done where I had the most, uh, the most rest- restraints mm. in that kind of way, but it, you know, it, it, it's okay. You just work with it. Was it now? Was it restraints based off of the publisher? Or was it restraints based off of all the all you authors together trying to hash out like the meta plot for that? It was kind of both because I mean the the writers did have input on the mega plot, and um, then the and as did the publisher, and of course the publisher had veto power, and as did you know Bob Salvatore because it was R. A. Salvatore's War of the Spider Queen, and it was all dealing with his. Um, dark elf stuff you know which is kind of his proprietary part of the forgotten realms really so um yeah there are a lot of people that were had input into it and a lot of people that could um veto stuff that i wanted to do but um you know it it never really felt heavy-handed or anything it just felt like uh, i was working within the parameters of the project and and how much of that happens where it's actually reversed where you would actually go to go to the publisher and say, Hey, so the, you know, the previous book I ever put together, there was this one section that I really wanted to touch on, but I just couldn't do it. It didn't fit in that storyline. Can I do a book about this? Has that ever happened? Well, when I did, um, it's, it's funny. I did a book, a trilogy called uh, year of rogue dragons, 
which was what I did after they came to me. And they said, we really want a trilogy that highlights all the different kinds of dragons in the Forgotten Realms. And, and can you write that? And of course I said, yeah. And I wrote it. And then I went to them and I, <clears throat> I went to them and I said, okay, how about a, we did, the people seem to like that. How about if we do a trilogy that highlights all the different kinds of undead in the Forgotten Realms? And they said, yeah, we really like that. And then they came back around and they said, well, you know, the land of Thay is crawling with undead and we want to evolve the land of Thay. So can you take your undead trilogy and have it be the trilogy that evolves the land of Thay? And I said, yeah. And uh, so we did that one. And uh, then with, um, from Haunted Lands, we, uh, I create, in the final book of that, I created uh, a mercenary company. And I wanted to write more about the mercenary company because I didn't feel like for all the zillions of Forgotten Realms book, I didn't really think that there was much that had been written about a mercenary company. And I had read, uh, you know, Bernard Cornwell and, uh, and stuff like that. And I thought, well, yeah, mercenary army would be a really interesting thing to write about in this context. And, uh, and they, they said, yeah, you can continue. Uh, you can continue with uh, your, your, Brotherhood of the Griffin Mercenary Company in its own series. We'll see how it does. And I was cranking those out merrily until they decided they weren't going to do Forgotten Realms fiction anymore if your name wasn't Bob Salvatore. And then so, <laughs> so there haven't been any of those for a while, but uh, they were, they were well liked when they were happening. And I certainly enjoyed writing them. And, and any of the stuff that you actually put into your own, uh, your own books for Forgotten Realms that has actually been now placed as, as, canon inside of any of the source books well i'm told that all the novels are were canon. canon yeah yeah so um i know that in one of the um i know that in one of the D D books where they're describing the various races when they came where they want to have some descriptive text about gnomes they picked the descriptive text that i had about a gnome and uh and plug plug that right into the book but um I mean, like I said, I guess everything is canon, but um, but uh, as far as with whether you'll find it alluded to, you know, as it says in the novel so and so by Richard Lee Byers, that this this is this. I don't think there's too much of that in the rule books. Although I was involved in the big project that was the um, supposed to kind of uh, make the Forgotten Realms back into more what it used to be. I was also I was also in the fall of the big project that made the Forgotten Realms into less <laughs> less what it used to be. But um, at a certain point, they had uh, they had a big um, time jump that was um, associated with uh, cataclysmic uh, events that uh, were supposed to reshape the Forgotten Realms, and it was supposed to be, kind of create a new jumping on point for fresh fans. Right. And I don't know it didn't really do that, and uh, I, I could. So I could go into why I think it didn't really do that, but it's not, it's not really relevant, but it, it didn't, it wasn't a big hit. And uh, it, it alienated more old fans than it brought in new fans. So we did a, another six book series where I wrote one of the books that were supposed to kind of fix it and put the realms back the way it was. So, um, so certainly when you look at the realms as they are today, you can say, well, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of back to normal because uh, these six writers, including buyers, you know, kind of patched it up again. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is it? So talk to us about the, what would you consider? Because, you know, some of your books are actually the, your own, your own, as you said, your own world building. What would you consider that as like some of the benefits and drawbacks of creating, you know, creating your own world? And writing about that well obviously you can do anything you want uh which is um which is kind of cool and you can um you can do i mean you can do th you can definitely do things that uh you couldn't do normally in a uh, work for hire ip situation because you know you can't you can't write the death of the Forgotten Realms. Even if we were still doing Forgotten Realms, you could write the death of Forgotten Realms because they want to continue coming out with product about that IP, right? And continue to make money on it. <clears throat> I mean, and so obviously we're not going to, you know, have the planet fall into the sun. But it it's, can be subtler than that because um, 
a lot of these worlds are built around some fundamental conflicts and uh, mysteries. And uh, as a, a writer, when you look at that world and come into the right story, you say, can say, um, boy, I'd really like to provide the answer to that mystery. Or I'd really like to settle this fundamental conflict once and for all. And those are natural instincts, but much of the time, that's the one thing you can't do. Because once again, it uses up a fundamental part of the IP that it was probably intended to generate product for years to come. Once in a while you can, like I said, they occasionally they'll let you make a uh, fundamental change of, of on some, one level or another. But generally that'll be when they come and say, talk to you and it, it breaks the idea and say, you know, we've decided that this, the world should change in this way that you should make it happen. Like they did with me with the land of Fay. you know, if I, you can't, um, Normally, you're the writer is not, I think, the initiator of the idea that, yeah, we're going to really change everything. <laughs> <laughs> and and so and what would what would you consider as 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 you as you're building building something? What would you do with? Uh, and so I've, I've talked to a few people who say, you know, what if you're if you're going to tell a story, you got to start with characters first then build the world around it. Then I have some other writers who say it absolutely you have to have the world then what you do is then you create stories within the world. So what would you consider, or do you, do you consider the, the character uh, first or the world first, or do you have some, uh, another, uh, another way of starting that outline that you would consider the most pertinent part of, of, of building a, a story from scratch? Well, if you're working in a like, pre-created world, you know, well, the world is there, right? Right. Uh, if... Um, but if you're not, I mean, I think that it's, um, I, I think it can vary. I really do. You can, um, I think you can start with the plot problem and then think about what's the most interesting character that could be the point man in, in dealing with this plot. Or I think you can uh, come up with a character first and say, what would be a really interesting thing to happen to this character? Or I think that you can come up with an interesting world or and say well what you know and say well what's an interesting story that could unfold in this setting and what kind of character would be interesting it really i mean it i think it can come you can start anywhere as long as you get to that point where you've got all the crucial elements and and what do you prefer to do because some of your do you when when you're working on your own ip when your own specific ip do you prefer it you know through that fantasy or because you also have uh um uh, you also as you said the vampire's apprentice a, a horror one which one do you find easier or or more exciting to write about either fantasy or horror i i don't know i've probably done more fantasy and um i kind of like um I kind of like pretty well for novels. I, I like books where um, I like books where the hero tends to come out on top, and a lot of times I don't know that that kind of is maybe a more natural fit for fantasy. Although you can certainly do it in horror too. In horror, you have, I think you have the big advantage where it's the genre that um, it's the genre where people really don't know going in whether it's going to come out okay or not. You know, if you read an epic fantasy, you kind of get the feeling that on some level, the good guys are probably going to win. Maybe not without some terrible losses and trauma along the way, but they're probably going to be okay. Right. Uh, if you read like, you know, you read Lord of the Rings, you, you know, you probably were never in serious doubt that somehow, some way that ring was going in that volcano. Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you read Conan, you know, you, you aren't ever really in any serious doubt that Conan is going to cut down the evil sorcerer and rescue the fair maiden or whatever. Right. Um, but in a horror novel, you can, a lot of times, you don't have that certainty. Sometimes they're, uh, some horror novels finish with good winning and some finish with evil winning. And that I think is kind of exciting and interesting and it's part of the appeal for the genre to me. So I guess what I'm working my way around to saying is that I don't necessarily prefer one genre to the other or find one genre more natural. I think that, um, I, I think that there's a lot of interesting things to do with each of them. Hmm. 
and I think there's also a fair amount of overlap with between them, at least the way I do them, because I mean, you know, a, a, a heroic fantasy novel has all kind of scary monsters and shit running around. Yeah. And um, similarly, a um, horror novel uh, tends to have characters who at least at some point look like they have a fighting chance of winning. Right. So there is conflict. I think that the, um, I think that the, the formulation where an overwhelming evil just rolls in and, and crushes everything can work in horror short fiction some of the time, but I think it makes for kind of lackluster horror novels usually. Right. Huh. And so uh, for, for the, for the writers that are listening to this, uh, talk to a bit about your, um, your method. So even you know, talk the, the logistics behind it. How how does Richard Lee Byers, you know, start it out? What do you do? You are you do you write at late night? Do you write in the morning? Does it? Do you have to do it after you know uh, you know just coffee or you have to have a big breakfast? Kind of, kind of talk to us about what your what your method is when you sit down and write. Okay. Again, I want to give a disclaimer that like every writer is different. You know, so right. don't think that like what I'm telling you is like the right way for you to do it. It just happens to be the way I do it. It was what works for me and people are free to, free to try it, but they should discard it without a second thought if it doesn't seem to work for them. But you know, what I do is I get up and I, uh, I write starting in the morning and, um, General, I, gener, assuming that I've got a work that's already going, I will begin by writing, or did I, excuse me, I begin by revising and polishing work from the past several days, which uh, reminds me what the hell I'm supposed to be talking about, and it kind of gets me back into the writing groove, and uh, they'll work my way through that, and then I'll be ready to write the day's new words, and the day's new words will um, normally be about... Uh, 1500 and uh, that's uh, that's a good quota for me it's it's enough that, that i don't it's enough that i make reasonable forward progress but not so much that it just trashes me out you know i can write i can write more if i'm on deadline and i need to write more but uh i don't enjoy my day nearly as much if i don't if, if i do too much more than that so i will write my 1500 new words and i will then write um well, that, that, excuse me, after writing that, I will go over that at least once and give it a, kind of its first revision and polish. And then, you know, I'm normally done. Mm. And do you usually... And that'll take me to usually kind of to mid-afternoon. Okay. And do you usually, do you write it single space or you, and then surprise yourself when you do double space or you do a double space straight away? I just, I just do a double space from the get-go. Yeah. It's easier to see. I mean, yeah. <laughs> why, why should I, uh, why should I get eye strain for doing it single space? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and do you also have do you also work with like say multiple projects at once like if you're kind of tired of one you know one story you kind of jump over like if you have like a short story you're working at the same time or you are just focused on the same the, the same story until it's done and move on to the next one my preferred method is to do one thing at a time but if um my opportunities and my deadlines are such that um I have to work on two things on the same day. I can work on two things on the same day. I'll do one and one, whatever, the one that kind of seems like kind of the, the bigger one, so to speak, and uh, do that first and then switch over and do the other. I'm anticipating um, if some things come together that I'll probably be writing a uh, my next novel and also a short story at the same time. But um, it, depending on how things fall together in the next few weeks i guess but um but normally i would rather just do one thing and finish up and be done with it right and uh also um advice for writers for instance because you also are you know in a as, as a writer it's also a bit it's it's your it's it's your life it's your it's your business as well yeah. um and advice on you know for when it comes to um when, it, when you're working with like for um contracts when they say this and then we you know for instance someone says you know consider a contract still a negotiation until you sign your name on it any pieces that you would say for any upcoming writers about how to work with that as well well you should you should always you should be aware that you can always 
you can't always ask like the thing I the thing I did recently, I asked for more money, and you know they they gave me a little more, so it was good. Uh, the um, and I there's sample contracts you can find that from science fiction, fantasy writers of America, and uh, I think maybe mystery writers of America, any of the different writers organizations, you can find sample contracts online, and you can also find uh, articles that have written the people have written about. Uh, this clause is really problematic. You should be very wary of um, signing a contract that's got this in it, okay. and uh, try and um, you know try and get that out. I would say that um, I personally have not had much luck with projects where it's um, no money up front, but you'll get um, but you'll get a piece of the royalties. Because I, I don't. This is just my pet theory, and you, you you may hear from countless publishers and 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 people that tell me, you know, I'm just full of shit. You know, that it's, it's not this way at all. But I'm inclined to think that a publisher that doesn't give you any money up front doesn't have any skin in the game, mm. and um, they have no real incentive to um, try to promote your book and make it a success. Whereas um, if they give you an advance, well, they, you know, they, they want to make it back, right? And make some money on top of it. So it's like, if, if, if you know, if, if they had give me an advance and nobody buys that book, they're out that money, you know? Uh, so uh, I think they're much more likely to, uh, you know, like I said, give you some uh, advertising or, try to get you on some uh, podcasts or, or, or something, you know? Right. Um, so like I said, just my personal experience is that the, um, you know, the royalties only contract is kind of problematic and the, um, the, uh, the pay on publication rather than pay on acceptance clause can be problematic as I have discovered in relation to one, notable project unfortunately i haven't gotten burned by that too much but i did uh i did one thing that is um i did one thing that was pay on publication and i did it years ago <laughs> so that thing that project still has not come out so that's not great uh and uh, what's the other thing oh you can um you, you can again do a little bit of online research and kind of find out what are acceptable word rates what is considered a professional word rate. If you're doing professional work, you should probably be getting a kind of a minimum of, a, of, of X, you know, of so many cents per word or whatever. It, it can vary to a degree depending on um, what specific kind of thing you're writing, I guess. But, and, but you, you want to you wanna be aware of that. Like if somebody says that, you know, they're going to give you a hundred bucks for writing a 90,000 word novel, you know, that's way out of line. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, and you you know you probably you know you can't uh, you can't ask for Stephen King money or J.K. Rowling money if you're just starting out, but uh, you don't want to just like under undervalue yourself right out of the bottom of what's an acceptable professional rate either. Right. Uh, so uh, talking about, we actually have uh, for those that would be listening to this, uh, uh, Richard has a screen uh, that's that has a it looks like it's it's your the new book that you're that is going to be coming out in October. That's true. I've got, um, yeah, it's, um, I, they just gave me permission to talk about it today. So amazingly enough, after I've been waiting for months to get the okay, it's one of those deals where the publisher has to, um, coordinate with the, uh, actual owner of the intellectual property. And uh, sometimes that the back and forth on that can really take a while, but anyway, it is, um, a Marvel Legends of Asgard novel. It's the first Marvel Legends of Asgard novel, in fact, and uh, also one of the two kickoff books in the whole Marvel novels line from Aconite Books, and it's called The Head of Mimer, and it's due out October 6th, so I hope everybody will take a look at that. It's from Aconite Books. Okay. And, it, uh, okay. It's the, uh, if, if, you know, I think that... Uh, I think that if you're a Marvel fan or a heroic fantasy fan or somebody that's interested in uh, Norse mythology, uh, it's, it's, it's got stuff for you. You'll probably like it. 
Wow. Okay. That's excellent. And, and Aconite. And so that's, and that's the one that you said that's uh, publishing that. And that's also part of an, uh, uh, yeah, the, and I, they're the ones that actually own the, the, what is it? Sub, how would you say that? Like have the part of the IP to allow the, yeah, they, um, they've contracted with Marvel comics to, okay. um, do novels based on, uh, some of their characters, other characters are licensed out of other places. So, you know, you, you, we didn't have unlimited choice on which characters we could feature, but, um, but there are a lot of cool Marvel characters, so it was fine. And, uh, yeah, so I've got that coming out at the first, in the first, uh, in the early in October. And then at the late in October, I'm told I'm supposed to have my, uh, Mutants and Mastermind superhero out, novel out from Green Ronin, which is called The Doom That Came to San Francisco. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So October will be uh, kind of a, will be novel, will be book month for me and also uh, kind of a comic book themed month for me. And yeah, just in time for, just in time for the holiday shopping too, as it's been coming out. Yeah. And, and so, and to be clear, as you said earlier, when you wrote the Mutants and Masterminds book, you did not, you did your, you did not put any of your your champions online. No, no, no. It's pretty much all their pre-existing characters from their universe. That's another thing that, um, another differentiating thing in, um, in doing this kind of work is sometimes you'll be creating characters that are all your own and plugging them into the setting, but it's your char your characters you made up. And sometimes you'll be taking characters that already exist in the setting and creating a new adventure for them. And that's what I did with Mutants and Masterminds. But of course, that's what I did with the Marvel book too. Right. And did you, did you were you able to put in any little Easter eggs for any of the Richard Bi or Richard Lee Buyer fans in there in your books? Like any passerbys walking past? You know, I never, that never occurred to me to do that. Maybe, uh, maybe in the sequels, assuming they want sequels, fingers crossed that they will, <laughs> the books will do well. Uh, but now it didn't occur to me to do that. I might, uh, I might uh, take a run at it next time. <laughs> this is great. Uh, so Richard, where can people find you? Okay. Well, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter mainly. Facebook is kind of like my premier place to be and communicate with fans. Or anything. I know it's problematic, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm there. And uh, like I said, I, I put information on Twitter to, uh, but you know, any if you want to know what's going on with me, basically, you know, you you can get it from Twitter. But if you want a kind of a more extended uh, conversation with me, you know, more more of the wonderfulness that is me, right? <laughs> uh, Facebook's probably the place to get it. Well, I know because I was, I, I uh, you know, this, you know, besides the books, I was also a big fan of your Ape of the Day that you had always put out on Facebook, which says yeah, taking a hiatus. Yeah, it's gone. To, yeah, after years of doing it, it's uh, it's on hiatus for now. My excuse is that my old computer that had all the Ape of the Day files is kind of defunct. But it was also got to be where it was really getting hard to do. So um, <laughs> it's like, you know, how many ape jokes can one person come up with, right? So uh, and, uh, how many different ape images that are significantly different from other ape images, you, images you already used to inspire a different joke? can you come up with so i don't know for sure if we'll get back to that or not i may feel inspired eventually because i know a lot of people enjoyed it <laughs> i know i it seemed like gorilla grod was on there i don't know at least you know yeah, like he was a dozen like the MVP times. of ape of the day I, yeah. <laughs> I, I found a lot of stuff to do with gorilla grod i uh, used Monsieur mala quite a bit um i used titanos um yeah, I use. Uh, let's see, uh, the mandrel from Marvel. I use. Um, uh, those were kind of like the main comic book apes, and then I, I used a bunch of uh, Tarzan and Cheetah ones. Right, and then just kind of if you go like in the annals of old movies, there's like a million uh, stills of some guy in an ape suit carrying off a beautiful woman so i used a bunch of those but, uh, like i said those are all the same though it gets really hard to come up with jokes that were based on right. that that are different than the jokes you told before yeah no and it, and it, def it definitely kind of had your character you know the characteristic your writing characteristics of those there was that you know that love there's a, there's definitely some of that the 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 witticism that you put in there was and almost to the point of where there was a, a you know a lot of uh 
editorializations of what people were thinking in the picture of some of those. And that was always entertaining. So, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I get back to it. Um, yeah. I've, I've, I've also thought of doing, uh, finding something else where there's a lot of images and maybe starting something different, but I don't know what that would be yet. Alien of the day or something. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll have to see. Like I said, it, it got to where it was taking a lot of time to actually come <laughs> up with this stuff. You know, it was, and it was a, when I started out, it was easy, you know, five, 10 minutes and I had one for the day. I had one for a day, but now it's like, yeah, I've been thinking about this for 45 minutes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Well, yeah, so this is great. We're already, we're already, it's already been an hour. So, it, you know, Richard, thank you very much. This has been great. And, and I'm, I'm sure our listeners and our, and our, and our, uh, our listeners and our, our, our viewers are, are going to be really excited for your, for your next book coming out um, on sale, October, October 6th, mm-hmm. the head of Mimir, um, a mar- part of a Marvel Legends of Asgard novel. As you say, this is what they're, they're relaunching it near the, you're the first one putting these books out then, correct? Yeah, well, they, I, I was, my book and another book are the first two, two. They come out on the same day. The other one is about the character Domino. Oh, okay. And I feel ashamed of myself because I can't remember the name of the writer. But, uh, but anyway, there's, there's that one. And then there's uh, uh, coming in, in the first group of five, there's a... Uh, another marvel legends of asgard book and there is a that one is by uh uh, cw werner i remember i got his name and there is a dr doom book by uh david uh anenson and uh, there is an x-men book so um those are your those are your first group of five Wow. And then hopefully they'll do great and there'll be many more and that a number of them will be by me. I hope. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And we'll be, and let, and let us know if you want to, uh, you know, you more than, you know, come back later. If you want to talk about some, any more of your, any more books that'll be coming out, we'd be more than, we'll be more than happy to have you come back on. Okay. Well, we, I'd be delighted to do that. We can do the, maybe if you, if you think you're ready, people would be interested we could talk about the mutants and mastermind book when it comes out at the end of october yeah but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll come on anytime you want all right all right thank you very much richard oh no problem thank you Now I put down. So it's do you, pro, do you know, is there a specific uh, genre of author you prefer? Because I put down on the the thing promotional saying fantasy, but do you prefer science fiction, fantasy, fantasy, or just just author? Or what would you? Uh, you could say maybe fantasy and horror. Okay, all right. I did see that. Yeah. With uh, you know various digressions, occasionally and other things, but mainly fantasy and horror. I did see you have some. Yeah, I did see you had some pulp like things as well. Some looks like some some like you know just like some crime books as well. Well, uh, you mean the Basil and Mobius stuff? Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's kind of that's not that's not straight up crime. There there are two characters who um, there there are two characters who are professional criminals basically, but they are constantly stumbling into. Uh, supernatural and paranormal and uh, uh, kind of situations. So it's, it's not, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fantasy adventure. I, I guess you'd modern fan, or I guess you kind of call it urban fantasy.